Happy Andy. Understand. Now we're talking, Franklin. I hope you can bring some leftovers back for us here. All right, Tony, we'll be all gone by the time we uh, get back. Okay, we'll need the name of your supplier.
much longer and uh, more developed limb than yesterday. Copy that. Copy that, Scott. That's what it looks like, exactly. Yeah, the view out of my office isn't nearly that nice. Yeah, I wish I could have this office all the time. Okay, we should be somewhere near the, uh, the burn. We'll try it out and see where we are. Columbia, your appearance with Voice of America is still on for 20 minutes from now at 1825. And you can give me a thumbs up. Got it. You guys are wonderful. Thank you.
Okay, good. And we will ask you, and I'm sure it's going to be astonishing to many people, how far you travel in a short space of time. We'll start first, if we could, with Lieutenant Colonel Horowitz. Uh, you have been conducting experiments. We love to refer to this as playing with fire. What have you been doing? Well, we have a uh, series of three different experiments we're working in our mid-deck glove box. And the one that I am working on with the researchers uh, out of Huntsville at Marshall Space Flight Center is uh, called Thrifty, which is a forced flame flow uh, transfer experiment where they uh, flow a uh, little bit of air over a sample and then under control conditions we ignite the sample and we look at how the flame propagates. And the big thing we learn, of course, is that the flame doesn't behave in space anything like on Earth. So we're learning a lot about uh, fire safety and, and how flames work and some basic science in flame research. There has been a lot learned about fire and fire control uh, in the various space missions. Good day, sirs. Uh, this is uh, Terry Wing. Lieutenant Colonel Horowitz, I know that uh, you're the pilot of this ship. Uh, Columbia underwent some overhauls back in 1992, but this buggy's 15 years old now, and it's traveled 100 million kilometers. Is it time to give it a place in the Air and Space Museum across the street from us? Well, uh, she may have a lot of kilometers on her, but I'll tell you what, she's a, she's a sweet ship. Uh, She's got a lot more miles and kilometers to go. Uh, she's operating almost flawlessly. Uh, if you've been uh, following the mission, we've had almost zero malfunctions on board. Um, I think she's just like a good bottle of wine. She keeps getting better with age. <laughs> <laughs> I know all of you are scientists uh, looking for answers that uh, your friends back in Houston and back in Italy can dream up. But uh, I was wondering something philosophical. Um, what do you see, do you see any value in the experience of space flight for non-scientists? For example, artists or musicians or poets, is there anything valuable for them up there? Well, uh, right now, you know, it's uh, mostly the scientists and the engineers that are up here flying and, and the pilots, of course, and there's a tremendous amount to be uh, shared in, in an artistic light. And we, we try to bring some of that back in a lot of the photo uh, we take. We take a tremendous amount of photos in space. A lot of it's used for Earth observations, but I think a lot of it's very artistic also. Uh, if you go through all the archives of all the photos we've taken, you'll see some absolutely beautiful, splendid pictures of the Earth. Um, some views that um, would make people who are philosophers probably think real, real hard about you know the origins of the universe and and life on the planet as we know it. It's, it's a much different view up here. Even for some of us hardcore engineers, you can't help but get a little artistic and philosophical just looking out at the beautiful planet below us. Mm -hmm. 